Chapter 378 The Chosen, Part 4 As we have mentioned in the previous chapter, there are many black groups in the Americas claiming to be the true Hebrew Israelites, displacing the Jews of Israel as fakes and impostors. All the black Hebrew Israeli groups use a myriad of arguments to buttress their claims or to discredit the Jews of Israel. Not all of the groups accept one set of arguments or evidences. However, the common denominator among all three groups is the belief in three claims. The first is a book written by a Jewish author and published in 1976, the second being the standard DNA test, and the third is the scripture itself. In this chapter, I will try to discuss each one of these hypotheses briefly. Let us begin with the first argument. The Thirteenth Tribe by Arthur Kessler was first published in 1976. Kessler claimed that the Ashkenazi Jews of Europe who immigrated to Palestine and founded the present-day Israel state were the descendants of Turkish tribes known as Hazars who converted to Judaism in 740 AD. He concluded that the Ashkenazi Jews today have no connection with the Jews of the Bible and hence have no right to claim that Palestine was their promised land. Kessler's theory has no any evidence and hence rejected by all scholars in the field. For example, the historian Bernard Lewis who has strong Arab sympathy, stated that this theory is supported by no evidence whatsoever. It has long since been abandoned by all serious scholars in the field, including those residing in Arab countries, where the Hazar theory is little used except in occasional political polemics. After the destruction of the Jewish Temple in 70 AD, the Roman took 97,000 prisoners who became slaves in Europe. When the Jews were freed and allowed to settle in Europe they formed two Jewish communities in Germany and Spain. The former was known as the Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews means German Jews, and Sephardim, Sephardic Jews means Spanish Jews. The term Ashkenazi formerly meant German Jews and later on applied to generically mean all Eastern European Jews. The so-called evidence of the DNA results is yet another way of point of contention. According to this school of thought, DNA tests prove that 98% of the Jews of today are non-Semitic. This claim itself has actually been disproved with the maturing DNA protocols. In short, the claim that 98% of the Jews are non-Semitic is simply a lie. Pure Semitic Jews from the Middle East countries like Iraq, Yemen, Iran, Egypt and Syria comprise 20% of the Jewish people today. Those Arabic and Hebrew-speaking Jews have never been to Europe and remain indigenous to the Arab countries up until the 20th century. As soon as the United Nations declared Israel as an independent state in 1948, they were heavily persecuted and forced by the Muslims to leave. So, even if we assume for the sake of argument, that all Ashkenazi Jews were Hazars, still more than 20% are pure Jews. It is important to state that all Islamic authoritative religious texts such as the Quran, Sunnah, Hadiths, and al Surah, biography of Muhammad, mention that there are considerable numbers of Jewish tribes in two of the main three cities of Arabia, Mecca, Medina, and Kabir. Two-thirds of the inhabitants of Medina at the time of reporting were Jews from the tribes of Banu Nader, Banu Kanaka, and Banu Kuraiza. Kaber was a Jewish city and inhabited by Jews only. Prophet Muhammad expelled the two Jewish tribes of Banu Nader and Banu Kanaka out of Medina and sent them to Palestine while he massacred all the men of the third Jewish tribe of Banu Kuraiza. He then redistributed their women and children among his Mujahideen as war booty. He also raided the Jews of Kaber, confiscated their homes and properties, and sent them to Palestine. These undeniable Islamic accounts have proved two important points. Point 1, the main Islamic religious texts never mentioned that Palestine belongs to the Arabs but in the contrary, the action of the Prophet Muhammad reinforces the idea that he believed the right place of the Jews is Palestine. Point 2, not all Jews who were forbidden by the Roman Emperor, Hadrian, to live in Palestine had left the region of the Middle East and dispersed in Europe and North Africa. In 135 AD Hadrian renamed Judea as Syria Palestina and Jerusalem as Elia Capodolina, and then he expelled entire Jewish communities out of the land. 
In order to claim Palestine as their historical homeland, the Arab Palestinians have done the same thing the black Hebrew Israelites of the Americas are trying to achieve. They claim that they are the descendants of the original Philistines who used to live in south of Judea and had engaged in constant war with the Israelites. Remember the story of David, an Israelite, and Goliath, a Philistine. The Roman Emperor, Hadrian changed the name of Judea and gave it the name Palestina after the name of the bitter enemies of the Jews, the Philistines. The Philistines had originally emigrated from the island of Crete and hence they were white Europeans who descended from Noah's son, Japheth. Those very same Philistines are extinct today. The Palestinians today are Arabs who are the descendants of Noah's son, Shem, and hence they are Semitic people. Therefore, as Semitic people they cannot be the descendants of the ancient Philistines who were Japhetic people. The Arab Palestinians also claim to be the descendants of the seven Canaanite tribes who lived in the land before the Jews took it from them. The Canaanites were the descendants of Noah's son, Ham. As Hematic people the Canaanites could not possibly be the ancestors of the Semitic Arab Palestinians. The ancient Canaanites also were wiped out and count today among the extinct tribes. The second claim to fame that the black Hebrew Israelites of America refer to is DNA studies. According to extensive DNA studies comparing Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews it was found that almost 75% of Ashkenazi male line is Semitic and 50% of Ashkenazi female line is Semitic. That means that 63% of Ashkenazi Jews are Semitic plus 20% of Sephardic Jews are Semitic equals 83% of the world Jewry being Semitic. A far cry from the lie claimed earlier that 98% of the Jews today are not Semitic. An 83% retention rate is amazing considering the pressure of exile and persecution against the Jews over the last 2,000 years. Moreover, genetic testing reveals that there is resemblance between the Samaritan Jews who had not left the area with the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. Supposedly, the strongest evidence employed in the argument is that the scripture supports the claim of the black Hebrew Israelites. Supporters of this school of thought use many verses from the Bible and borrow extensively from the Apocrypha. It is not possible to go through those hundreds of verses in order to refute them all. It is suffice to discuss the ground upon which the said claim was built. According to this claim, the suffering endured by the Negroes during the time of the transatlantic slave trade and during their years in bondage, as slaves, in the Americas could be pointed out scripturally as punishment for their disobedience of the law of Moses. I know the term Negro or Niger is a derogatory name, but the so-called black Hebrew Israelites refer to themselves as Negroes and hate to be addressed as Africans. Simply put, the word Negro or Niger means black person in Greek language and mentioned in the Bible only one time. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, Acts 13, 1. Therefore, suffering is the gist of the matter. No one doubts or denies the huge injustice and severe suffering heaped upon the poor Negroes in the hands of the slavers. They were invaded and captured by the Arab slave masters and haunted like wild animals from their villages by the assistance of other African slave traders. The Arab and North African Muslims enslaved and sold approximately around 100 million African slaves. This number might sound as exaggeration to the reader. I strongly believe it because in my country Sudan alone one single black Arab slave trader captured, owned, and sold over a million Sudanese as slaves. He was known as al Zibar Basha. He was the only Sudanese to receive the royal title of Basha from the Turks who jointly with the British ruled Egypt and Sudan. He used to have his own army that called al Basbozag, we obey no one except you. He was like Lucifer and his soldiers like fallen angels. They were among the cruelest human beings ever to walk on the surface of this planet. Imagine, such an evil man being so honored in Sudanese history as a great hero and the biggest street in Khartoum today is named after him. A man who enslaved and sold his own Sudanese people went into history as great man. 
he sold over a million to the Muslim Turks and the Turks sold them to the European settlers who shipped them to the New World or the slave markets in Europe. Even the British Army, when slavery was internationally abolished, could not defeat al zibair Basha's army or prevent them from continuing the slave trade. His army continued to raid the African towns and villages of West, South, and Central of Sudan and take their inhabitants as slaves until the Turks of Egypt were forced by the British who appointed them rulers over Egypt to intervene and stop him. Accordingly, the Turks called al zibair Basha to Cairo and when there they prevented him from returning to Sudan and kept him in Egypt until his death. The Arab Muslims were the ones who changed the name of Sudan from the land of Kush to Ard al-Sud, al-Sudan. Ard al-Sud in Arabic means the land of the people of black faces. The phrase is used in Arabia as an insult rather than a description. Whenever, an Arab man wants to insult a black African, he calls him Ya Asad al it is same as saying, God curse you. O oh man of black face. An Ethiopian black man by the name of Bilal was the first caller of prayer in Islam. Even though, he was provoked to anger by that negative phrase by some companions of the Prophet of Islam. Another black companion by the name of Yasir ibn Amar was also called the man of black face. When Muslim army invaded northern Sudan and defeated the Sudanese Christian army they forced an unfair treaty upon them. According to the first article of that treaty, the Nubian Sudanese have to pay 360 slaves every year as jizya to the Caliph of Islam in Arabia. They have to be young boys and girls. The Christian Nubians fulfilled that demand for a thousand year until eventually got conquered and Islamized by the Arabs. During the rise of Islam, the Arab Muslims along with the Africans who converted to Islam initiated and implemented the slave trade. The Arabs were the first people to subject the Africans into slavery. The Muslim Arabs raided African villages seeking humans to sell as slaves. With these efforts being largely unsuccessful, they began to seek the aid of blacks or newly converted Africans to their faith. 14 to 20 million African men, women and children died due to this slave trade. The Arab slave trade lasted from the mid of the 7th century until the 20th century. Even today, there are Arabs in Mauritania, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia who own black slaves. Nevertheless, there are no complete records and estimates vary from a few millions to 100 million people. However, not all that number landed in the New World. Most records don't exceed 11 millions. Many African slaves were shipped to slave markets in Europe. Some were sold in the Arab slave markets. Untold numbers of slaves died on the long desert way of the Great Sahara Desert due to fatigue and starvation. The Arabs' involvement in the transatlantic slave trade lasted a staggering three centuries long. Their involvement in the Sahara Desert slave trade was 14 centuries long. Islam promotes an institutionalized, religiously sanctioned slave trade. The Quran allows the taking of slaves as war booty against non-Muslims. The Arab Muslims believed that the Africans were like dumb animals and because of a presumed higher sexual appetite many African slaves were castrated and made to serve in their Arab masters' homes. The great 14th century Muslim scholar Ibn Khaldun, wrote, The black nations are, as a rule, submissive to slavery, because, blacks, have little that is, essentially, human and possess attributes that are quite similar to those of dumb animals, Bernard Lewis, Race and Slavery in the Middle East, 1992, page 53. In early Islamic states of the Western Sudan, present-day West Africa, including Ghana, 750-1076, Mali, 1235-1645, Sigu, 1712-1861, and Songhai, 1275-1591, about a third of the population were enslaved by the Muslim slave traders. The Sahara Desert slave trade has six major routes. 80% of the black slaves died in transit. They were chained together and forced to march barefooted and naked for many days in the blazing heat of the Sahara. They were given little food and water. 
water is scarce commodity in that endless arid desert. Sometimes, they were forced to drink camel urine or their own. The Prophet Muhammad taught that there is good medicine in the urine of a camel. About 20 million have died in the Sahara Desert slave trade and other 8 million died before those trade markets were created. When the slave markets were set up in West Africa, the Arab Muslims sold the African slaves to the European settlers in millions. An estimated 11 million slaves were victims of the transatlantic slave trade. 95% went to South and Central America and 5% went to North America. It is estimated that the ultimate death toll was 112 million blacks who were killed either during the Islamic holy wars, jihad, against the African villages and during their slave trades. It is sad that great African Americans like Muhammad Ali Kelly and Malcolm X converted to Islam believing that Christianity is the religion of the whites and Islam is the religion of the blacks. They were deceived by the false prophet Elijah Muhammad and beguiled by the enticing words of Louis Farrakhan. They and all the followers of the Nation of Islam were ignorantly identified themselves with their Arab Muslim masters who acted as middlemen and sold their ancestors to the Europeans who bought and brought them to the Americas. The Arab Muslims dumped them in a boat and sold them. Prophet Muhammad hated blacks and considered them inferior race. In one of his hadiths he said, if anyone proclaims the Prophet Muhammad to be black, he is to be killed. Another hadith of the same vein, records his likening a black man to Satan. His advice to anyone who wishes to gaze on Satan's face to simply look at a black man. In yet another hadith, he says that fever comes in the form of a black woman. The poor Africans were stuffed like sardines in the slave ships, chained together like wild beasts. During their transfer, they were denied their basic needs, deprived of sustenance, beaten tortured, raped, and killed. They were chained together and not freed from their fetters for fourteen days. They ate and went to washroom in the same place. They were not allowed to wash their clothes or bodies. When their cages began to smell their captors poured water on them as if they were dangerous beasts. Many succumbed to diseases brought on by their enforced captivity at sea. The dead were not accorded proper rights. Their dead bodies were hurled offboard into the raging waves of the Atlantic Ocean. Sharks followed slave ships for every now and then a fresh meat would appear. Those who made it to the New World had to endure separation from their dear ones. Parents were separated from their children, wives from their husbands, and tribesmen from their kin. When they were there their real abuse and misery would begin. They were treated like animals and sold in slave markets. They were forced to work around the clock without wages. They became mere property to their owners who bought them, entitling the owner to beat, rape, and force them to do whatever he liked. Sometimes, a wife would be raped in front of her husband and her master would ask her to enjoy it or he would torture her and her husband to death. We are told that in rare cases, a negro baby was used as an alligator bait. Whether that was a rare occurrence or not only God knows. Lynching was so common and the law wouldn't punish for it. Lynching is the practice whereby a mob usually several dozen or several hundred persons takes the law into its own hands in order to injure and kill a person accused of some wrongdoing. The alleged offense can range from a serious crime like theft or murder to a mere violation of local customs and sensibilities. The issue of the victim's guilt is usually secondary since the mob serves as prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner. Due process yields to momentary passions and expedient objectives. A Philadelphia physician has his shoes made from the skin of Negroes. Ghastly, but true. Molten Advertiser November 19, 1896 Some people used to believe that a Negro has no feelings as an ordinary human being and hence if his child is tortured in front of him or his wife got raped he wouldn't feel anything just like the animal that witnessed the same done to its baby or mate. This belief is based and supported by the theory of evolution which teaches that some races are less evolved and have the characteristics of animals rather than humans. The slaves' owners invented various wicked ways of punishing them for disobedience. 
Sometimes, a disobedient Negro would be forced to eat the excrement of his owner or that of another Negro. Yet, another evil practice, was hanging them in the backyards of their owners for mere amusement. There is a picture from the archive which shows that some black slaves were kept in a human zoo for the European tourists to see them. Another picture shows a black woman carrying a monkey instead of a human baby. In 1904 the World's Fair was held in St. Louis, Missouri. A pygmy man from Africa called Otabenga was put in a cage with a chimpanzee. Otabenga was a married man who had a wife and two kids. He felt so humiliated that he committed suicide after the fair was over. The place where that World's Fair was held is today the Animal Zoo in St. Louis, Missouri. There were other 2,000 primitive peoples displayed in that fair. The purpose of the display was to demonstrate the superiority of the white Americans who had evolved further. Anthropologist W. J. McGee designed the display, The Century for Young People by ABC, Peter Jennings. In order to prove the theory of evolution many Australian Aborigines were shot and killed and their skulls were boiled in hot water and then shipped internationally to be displayed as proofs of the so-called missing link of that satanic theory. The theory teaches that some races are more favoured than other races. Evolution led Hilter to kill 6 million Jews, Joseph Stalin to murder 20 million Russians, and Pol Pot killed one half of his population in Cambodia. Unfortunately, that theory is taught as fact until today in schools. The Bible said about God, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, Acts 17, 26. According to Wikipedia, African American slaves were punished by whipping, shackling, hanging, beating, burning, mutilation, branding and slash or imprisonment, whipping, execution and sexual abuse of women, including rape, were common. Slave masters even beat pregnant women. Besides slaves were being vastly overworked, they suffered branding, shootings, and floggings. Slaves work unlimited number of hours in a day until a law restricted it to 15 hours a day in summer and 14 hours per day in winter. Education of slaves was generally discouraged for fear that knowledge and literacy would cause rebellion. Many female slaves were sold at auction into concubinage or prostitution, which was called the fancy trade. Frederick Law Olmsted visited Mississippi in 1853 and wrote, A cast mass of the slaves pass their lives, from the moment they are able to go afield in the picking season till they drop worn out in the grave, in incessant labor in all sorts of weather, at all seasons of the year, without any other change or relaxation than is furnished by sickness, without the smallest hope of any improvement either in their condition, in their food, or in their clothing, which are of the plainest and coarsest kind, and indebted solely to the forbearance or good temper of the overseer for exception from terrible physical suffering, reef, cathartic 2007, poverty in America.